Hi, this is Joel Curtis with your Alaska Weather. Starting out with our warnings, watches, and advisories, we have a blizzard warning for St. Lawrence Island and the Bering Strait coast, 50 miles an hour, gusts, uh, blowing snow, drifting snow, and whiteout conditions at least until midnight tonight. Also, we have a winter weather advisory for the Cusquam Delta coast uh, through at least 6 p.m. tonight, and also for Bristol Bay all the way through uh, 1 a.m., tomorrow morning and that's for again for some snow some blowing snow and wintry conditions then we have a wind chill advisory for the klondike highway and that's uh through tomorrow morning uh that's for white pass and uh it's for wind chill 35 below and just now being issued is a potent is an, a, a winter weather advisory for yakutat for snow uh, at least four inches, and that's from 9 a.m. Thursday to to 9 a.m. on Friday. So onshore flow there and uh, snow building up. And here's our satellite image. We see a low pressure system that uh, was out in the uh, western Bering. It is now moving into the central Bering Sea, uh, quite wrapped up with a bunch of fronts. You can see the uh, warmer air aloft has spread into Dillingham, Kodiak, and Sand Point area. Also, uh, notice some streaky clouds from north to south uh, coming out of southeast Alaska, and that's representative of the offshore winds that they've had over there. Uh, also, some scattered light clouds uh, over the central and northern interior. So, for today's weather, we have that 966 millibar low in the central Bering Sea. Uh, quite a bit of snow showers and uh, even some mixed rain and snow around that system. Uh, plenty of wind with uh, uh, some gusts. Uh, you can see that the front is moving up to the, the southwest coast. That's where we're having some problems with the snow and also through the Bering Strait with the wind uh, blowing northerlies and, and coming down that direction. Also, we have an Arctic front off the coast of southeast Alaska, and the outflow winds are causing some real big wind gusts down there. And some warm air is starting to move into the Gulf, but it's not extremely warm. Arctic high pressure 1034 over the Yukon. For tonight's weather, that low in the bearing has weakened to 978 millibars, and a weak frontal system is moving into the western Aleutians. The, there, a secondary low has formed near Kodiak Island, 993 millibars, and it, the uh, Arctic front has now turned into a trough with some northward movement. There's mixed rain and snow out over the Gulf, snow over in the entire southwestern portion of the state. But look at the uh, uh, relatively uh, partly cloudy area uh, from the Arctic high pressure from southeast Alaska all the way up to Point Hope. And then for Thursday's weather, that pair of low pressure systems is persisting. 980 millibars off of Nunavak Island. Uh, snow showers all over across the Bering Sea. If you get farther south, you can see some mixed rain and snow showers, barely touching the Aleutians and, and certainly on the Pacific side. We also have a 983 millibar low pressure off of Kodiak Island. A well-developed front has uh, formed. Uh, onshore flow for now has spread eastward to the Yakutat area and almost to Cape Spencer. And then uh, snow continuing over the, much of the southern portion of the state. And then on Friday, we have a low pressure, 979 millibars, still persisting off of Kodiak Island. And several low centers into the Gulf of Alaska, still offshore flow for southeast Alaska, with snow because the warm air is riding up over that system and the wind is still uh, blowing pretty good in a lot of those places including offflow winds from Yakutat Bay. Also uh, some snow still over south central area 
And also a band of snow is now over the western coast and on up into the Brooks Range. And then we have a very warm system way out in the Aleutians. It's affecting the area from Adak westward, and there is some snow associated with that system there. So our low temperatures Thursday morning, starting out with, the, with southeast, single digits on the inside waters, up to 18 at Ketchikan, 14 at Yakutat, 21 at Sitka. Then as we move further west, minus 18 for Gulkana, but still in the teens and the mid-20s for South Central, 8 for Talkeetna, and then as we get down to Kodiak, above freezing at 34. As we look along the north slope, minus teens, well into the minus teens, minus 21 as we get down toward the Brooks Range, and minus 27 all the way over, way over in the eastern Brooks Range, minus 28 in the Yukon Flats, so pretty cold air over in that section. As we get over to Kotzebue, minus 6, Nome, plus 10, St. Lawrence Island, plus 9, and as we get down to the Yukon Delta, plus 10. Our low temperature Thursday morning as we go out toward the southwest, single digits as you are inland, but 22 at about Bethel, 16 uh, Dillingham, 23 for King Salmon, and then as you go out the peninsula, mixed 30s and 30, 35s, 31 for the Privilofs and 30 for Shimia. Then in, on Friday after, on Thursday afternoon, we have the mid 20s and even the teens as you get up in the Lynn Canal area for uh, Southeast Alaska, 30 for Yakutat, seven for Golcana, 25 for Valdez. As we move over to South Central in the mid 20s, to actually lower 30s. 21 for Talkeetna, and 37 for Kodiak. Thursday afternoon along the North Slope, negative teens to minus 9. For the Eastern Brooks Range, minus 17. Yukon Flats, minus 24. As you get over to Kotzebue, minus 3. 12 for Nome. So a little bit warmer air on that side over there. Uh, 13 for the, for the Yukon Delta, and then minus 5 for the Fairbanks area. For high temperatures for Thursday afternoon, as we go out southwest, mid-30s, and up to almost 40 for the Alaska Peninsula, 34 for the Pribilofs, 37 for Adak, 35 for Shimia, and plus 12 for St. Lawrence Island. Our low temperatures Friday morning in southeast, single digit 9 near Skagway, in the teens on the inside waters, but 29 out at Sitka, 20 at Ketchikan, 28 for Yakutat, minus 6 for Gulkana, right around 20 for Anchorage and Kenai, and up to 30 at Kodiak, and then as we get a, a little bit warmer as we go further out west. For low temperatures Friday morning, minus teens again along the north slope, minus 26 for the eastern Brooks Range, minus 26 for the Yukon Flats, minus 7 for Fairbanks, as we get further west, uh, minus 11 for Kotzebue, but up to minus 1 for Nome, minus 8 for St. Lawrence Island, and 7 as we get on to, out to the Yukon Delta. Going out toward uh, the southwest, uh, mid-20s as, as, uh, as we get on to the Alaska Peninsula, and then you'll see a mix of uh, 30s and 20s as we go on out, as we get into the Aleutians, around uh, the lower 30s as we go further out, and then 22 for the Privilofs. Our high temperatures Friday afternoon for the Panhandle, 37 for, for Sitka, 34 for Ketchikan, up to 30 and 29 for the inside waters, 24 as you get up Lynn Canal, 34 for Yakutat with that snow going on there. 36 for Kodiak, 10 for Gulkana as we get into the mid-20s over at, uh, at uh, uh, South Central. And then finally, minus teens as we are along the North Slope, minus 3 for, for Bethel. Uh, 10 as you go out the, minus 10 as you go out the Seward Peninsula. And then for Friday afternoon, our high temperatures in the 30s as we go out the Alaska Peninsula. And folks, that's it for our, our time has run out there, but uh, stay safe and got, uh, please review those warnings by going to uh, uh, weather. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Hi, everyone.
everyone, and now for your aviation weather. Starting out flying weather Thursday morning, have an extensive area of IFR from the Bering Sea across the southwest Alaska, into Cook Inlet and Kodiak Island and over Prince William Sound. Also a bit of IFR over the Yukon Flats and just north of the North Slope. For Thursday afternoon, the IFR has spread uh, further east uh, all along the uh, Gulf Coast, uh, parts of Kodiak Island, also for southwest Alaska. And then for Friday morning, IFR uh, moving a little bit further east, uh, although you can see that the panhandle is mostly VFR, uh, some uh, east of Kotzebue Sound there, uh, all across the southwest Alaska and uh, the uh, lower Kenai Peninsula, as well as Prince William Sound. And then for Friday afternoon, a little bit uh, on the east side of Kotzebue Sound, some over the Kuskokwim Delta, uh, also into Bristol Bay from the Pribilofs, and uh, all along the uh, Gulf Coast uh, from the southern Kenai Peninsula over to the Panhandle. And note uh, some IFR conditions moving into the Western Aleutian with the next system. Our past conditions on Thursday, uh, starting out with Anatovic uh, VFR, but when you uh, leave the north entrance, uh, expect some marginal VFR conditions. Same thing with Attigan Pass VFR, except uh, marginal VFR to the north. Lake Clark IFR, improving to marginal VFR as well as Merrill. Rainy Pass, IFR improving to marginal VFR. Windy Pass, marginal VFR, but some IFR to the west. Isabel Pass, VFR, decreasing to marginal VFR conditions. Mentassa Pass, VFR, also going down to marginal VFR in the afternoon. Tanita Pass, IFR conditions. Portage Pass, IFR, and expect turbulence in the afternoon. Chilkoot and White Pass, a VFR, and expect turbulence in the morning. For our freezing levels, most of the warm air is south and southeast of Kodiak Island, up to 6,000 feet, but as you can see, most of the state has at the surface. For icing on Thursday, we have an extensive area of considerable moderate below 10,000 feet. That will include Kodiak Island, uh, Lake Clark, and Lake Iliamna areas, all of Cook Inlet and parts of Prince William Sound and all of the Kenai Peninsula. And this is with that weather system that's moving up. As you get further west and northwest, it's all below 4,000 feet and, and just isolated moderate. If you're out and have to fly the Aleutians, we're going to have some considerable moderate all along the Aleutian Islands below 8,000 feet. Our jet stream on Thursday, uh, most of the jet is over the Aleutians, up to 155 knots, a little bit of northwesterly jet over the north slope, around 60 to 75 knots or so, and some westerlies going into southeast Alaska. For the 9,000 bit winds, we have two circulation centers, and it's, uh, it's not driving a whole lot of wind at 9,000 uh, over most of the state. However, the Aleutians has ramped up all the way to 100 knots and over in Alaska, about 55 knots or so. For 3,000 foot winds on, on Thursday, we have uh, some easterlies going through the Bering Strait up to about 50 knots or so, 35 knots easterlies over the North Slope, 40 knots over west, just west of Kotzebue Sound. And then we have that circulation center that is uh, just south of Seward, and it's got 50 knots on shore plus 30 knots as you get further east, about uh, Yakutat or Icy Bay or so. Also, the second circulation center, you got about 55 knots over the Privilege, so some pretty rough flying over the southern Bering Sea, anywhere in the Aleutians, with a really strong burst of westerlies. And then for our turbulence on Thursday, we have below 4,000 feet, some considerable monitor, down through the Bering Strait. We get to some isolated severe, both for the Privilofs the Western Aleutians, and over lower Cook Inlet. And be sure to be very cautious about low-level wind shear in the Cook Inlet area and Chillicoff Strait area.
On March 11, 2011, a 9.0 magnitude earthquake off the Pacific coast of Japan generated a tsunami. This series of ocean waves sped towards the island nation with waves reaching 24 feet high. The result was devastation and utter destruction. Towns were engulfed by water and swept away. Farmland was flooded. Tens of thousands of lives were lost. The National Police Agency reported damages to hundreds of roads, bridges, and more than 100,000 buildings. The surging water flooded rivers and destroyed harbors. In some areas along the coast, tsunami waves reached six miles inland. Tsunamis not only cause severe damage when they first strike land, but also as the water recedes back to sea. Tsunamis can inflict this type of damage because of some unique features. As tsunami waves travel across ocean basins, they may be as little as a few centimeters high, but they extend down to the ocean floor. This is different than traditional waves, which are only surface features. Tsunamis can also travel hundreds of miles per hour in the open ocean. As these waves approach a coast, the shallowing ocean floor slows the waves down and pushes the water mass upwards. The quicker the ocean floor transitions from deep to shallow, the greater potential for a higher wave height. So, tsunamis that experience this sudden shift into shallow water can have the height and momentum to pack a serious punch. Unfortunately, Japan found itself in this scenario. This image shows how abruptly the Japanese islands rise out of the ocean. Other coastal areas in the region have much more gradual slopes. The earthquake on March 11th was the most powerful known to hit Japan, and the tsunami it created had the necessary ingredients to make it such a deadly and destructive force. Eighty miles east of Japan, a 9.0 magnitude earthquake rocks the ocean floor. This disturbance causes a transfer of energy from the seafloor to the ocean, generating a series of ocean waves known as a tsunami. In about 20 minutes, waves strike the Japanese coastline. Other nations go on high alert because the tsunami will propagate or spread throughout the Pacific Ocean. As the tsunami radiates outward from Japan, it encounters a variety of ocean features, such as ridges and underwater volcanoes, which guide the tsunami and create a complex pattern of scattering and reflective waves. In eight hours, the waves reach the Hawaiian Islands, and in nine and a half hours, they hit the west coast of the United States. In 16 hours, the tsunami reaches the Indian Ocean and New Zealand, and by 22 hours, the entire Pacific Ocean had been affected. The impact of a tsunami can be highly variable because of the complicated interactions with ocean features and coastline elements. Wave height and speed will differ from place to place. Since tsunamis can be hundreds of miles long and travel thousands of miles away from where they originated, they are considered a worldwide threat when they form. These are the sounds of a tsunami warning. They alert residents that a killer wave is about to strike. These sirens, however, are just a small part of the sophisticated warning systems that played a role in Japan and in the US during the Pacific Ocean tsunami in March 2011. Most tsunamis are generated by an undersea earthquake. Fortunately, Japan has one of the most advanced earthquake early warning systems in the world. It detects tremors, calculates the epicenter, and sends out warnings from over a thousand seismographs scattered throughout the country. 
The Japan Meteorological Agency issues the warnings and sends alerts to television and radio channels, the internet, and mobile phone networks. When the earthquake struck 80 miles offshore, warnings were generated in about three seconds. The tsunami warnings came three minutes later. These take longer because more complex calculations are involved and must factor in ocean data. Since the first tsunami wave struck the coastline within 20 minutes, the advanced warning provided some residents with crucial minutes to reach a safe area. While the earthquake sent powerful tsunami waves westward toward Japan, the tsunami also propagated east into the Pacific Ocean. Here, warnings are issued by the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center, operated by NOAA in Hawaii. NOAA maintains a large network of buoys with ocean floor sensors that are strategically positioned in the earthquake-prone zones of the Pacific. This system collects vital ocean data for tsunami forecasting. On March 11th, only 25 minutes after the earthquake struck, the first buoy station measured the tsunami and relayed information to Hawaii. Scientists used this data to run models and issue forecasts and warnings to nations throughout the Pacific. From there, local emergency managers decided what actions were appropriate to take for public safety. The earthquake and resulting tsunami devastated the Japanese coastline, causing damage that will take years to repair. While we can't prevent these forces of nature from happening, our early warning systems can help us prepare for the dangers headed our way. And now, marine weather around Alaska. And now for your marine weather. Uh, starting out with today's sea ice edge, ice edge has advanced past St. Matthew Island, and for Thursday and Friday, expect some erosion in Bristol Bay, but also a southward continuance in the central Bering Sea. For Thursday's marine forecast on the inside waters, 10 to 20 knots, and seas up to 4 feet, generally northerlies, outflow wind. However, on the outside, expect southeasterlies, 15 all the way up to 35 knots, and seas all the way up to 9 feet when you get further north and west. On Friday, still some outflow winds in the inside waters, 20 to 25 knots, and seas up to 6 feet. But then when we get on the outside, expect easterlies and southeasterlies 30 to 40 knots and seas around 15 feet. For south central waters, we have circulation around the low, gale force 35 knots on the outside and seas up to 12 feet. For Prince William Sound, easterlies 25 knots, seas 6 feet. And then for Cook Inlet, an outflow with uh, 20 all the way up to 35 knots as you get further south and seas all the way up to 12 feet. For Friday's forecast, you can see the circulation around the low, 25 all the way up to 40 knots and seas up to 15 feet on the outside. For Prince William Sound, easterly is 35 knots, gale force, sea 7 feet. And then for Cook Inlet, 20 to 30 knots, again outflow, seas 8 feet down by Augustine. For Alaska Peninsula and Kodiak Island, generally westerlies. On the Pacific side, 30 all the way up to 40 knots and seas all the way up to 20 feet, and they're generally westerlies circulating around the low. On the Bering Sea side, 20 to 35 knots and 22 feet as you get further south out by Coal Bay and, and opposite Sandpoint, and that's with all that flow around that low. Then when we get to Friday, again, circulation around the low in the Gulf, northwesterlies, 20 all the way up to 45 knots and seas up to 21 feet as you get further south. And on the Bering Sea side, 15 knots in Bristol Bay or so, seas 7 feet. But as soon as you get out further out into the Bering Sea, westerlies, 40 knots and seas 23 feet. For the Aleutian chain, strong westerlies. 45 down to 35 knots, the further east you get. 
seas all the way up to 24 feet on the Bering Sea side and up to 26 feet on the Pacific side. Then the, on the Western Aleutians for Friday, you start to see some circulation around the next low pressure system farther to the west, southerlies 40 and seas 16 feet in the Western Aleutians, but then we still have the circulation around the low in the Gulf, up to 40 knots both on the Bering and Pacific sides, 21, 22 feet on the Bering side and up to 23 feet on the Pacific side. For the west coast, you can see the offshore flow circulating around the low in the Bering Sea and up to 20 to 30 knots. Sea 17 feet as you get south of St. Matthew Island, but a whole gale, 45 knot westerlies in the, in the Privilos, seas up to 26 feet. And then we have northerlies and northwesterlies on Friday, 20 all the way up to 35 knots and 40 knots down at the Privilos, and seas up to 18 feet in the Privilos. Along the north slope, easterlies 20 down to 15 knots, and then when you get down to the Bering Strait, northerlies around 30 knots. And then for Friday, again, 20 knots along the north slope and increasing to 25 to 35 knots along the northwest coast to 35 knots in the Bering Strait. So for tonight's weather, the low pressure system in the Bering Sea with the frontal system moving onshore in southwest Alaska, another low developing near Kodiak Island, 993 millibars. And then for, for Thursday, a pair of lows, 980 weakening in the Bering Sea, 983 near Kodiak Island, frontal system moved onshore southwest. For Friday, oh, several low centers in the Gulf of Alaska, front still offshore, snow over southeast, snow in the western portions, and warm air coming up in the western Bering Sea. That's all the time we have. Thanks for tuning in. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.